Welcome to Quarantine. I am Science Mom. This is Math Dad. And I want to say hello really quickly to you and welcome to King Potato from Maryland, JQMD from Texas, Evelyn from California, Galen from Utah, Heather from Washington, Lindsay from Alaska, Hayden from South Carolina, Christina from Maryland, um, AC from the Philippines, Connie from Virginia. Welcome to you wherever you're watching and welcome to you if you're watching the replay. We're really happy to have you here. So somebody's already pointed out in the chat that we're wearing some new shirts. We are. So Math Dad's um, hit him shirts for the annoying song came yesterday. <laughs> Science Mom shirts have not arrived yet, but I decided to support him with solidarity because this little song of his has become quite the um, quite the classic. I think it must be because she secretly likes it. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> and I know that some of our fans don't like the song either. We get we get requests for the song to to stop periodically, but I think we have more people who like it. <laughs> now today we are going to do an awesome lesson on photosynthesis and I'm seeing more people saying where they're watching from in the chat it's so amazing to see all these places Iowa Michigan Virginia hello everybody now our schedule just in case you are new and not familiar with with quarantine our schedule runs a bit like this we start off with an art showcase because every single day we give an art prompt and we get these wonderful submissions of art. And then we have a science lesson, fact or fiction, a little trivia segment, a math lesson, a little riddle called what's in the bag, an engineering challenge, and then Math Dad likes to end with a math mystery, mm -hmm. sort of a higher level thinking challenge. And a lot of you got yesterday's math mystery. So Actually, let's- fewer, fewer than I would have guessed though. So we'll, we'll talk about that. All right. Let's share our screen and bring up our art showcase because yesterday's art prompt was to draw something from the perspective of an ant. And we had some fantastic submissions come in. It was really fun to see just the variety of objects and the variety of perspectives that we that we had. So great job, Cormac, here with the scooter kind of down at an angle. And I love how different the dinosaur looks. If you were as small as an ant, all you would really see are legs. That, that's right, dinosaurs would look as Big as they actually are. Yeah. yeah. A water battle table from an ant's perspective. Nice. Good job, Elsa. Good water bottle. And Amelia drew, ooh, I love the little scale here with her point of view of this That's little rock right. and the ant's point of view. We've got another <laughs> dinosaur over here. Great work, Liam. <laughs> made in China. Yep. An Easter egg. Nice. Good job, Luca. Good job, Luca from Germany. Woohoo. And Luca loves the song. Gut gemacht. <laughs> Scissors from an ant's point of view, nicely done. Mm -hmm. And if I got big with eating food, good job. <laughs> doors. Oh, yeah, and the doors look different if you're down low. Mm -hmm. And then look, there's a little ant being like, what is this? Down there, good job, Jaden. Giant pink flamingo. The ant watching the car, very nice, Ivan. Great work. <laughs> And a small strawberry, tonight we feast. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> a small strawberry would be a big feast for an ants, colony of ants. The cat toys look gigantic. They do, they look huge in front of the cat there. Good job, Cameron. Oh, and then we've got nice chalk art here with the ants coming up and it looks like, looks to me almost like they're ready to invade a picnic or something, I love it. An ant's point of view of a tree, very nice. Good nice job, Brock. Brock. Huh? All, all these toys that look enormous. They look enormous, yeah. Very nice job, Caroline. Those are really fun eyes. I love it, yeah. Oh, the, the ant doesn't like my song? Is that me? <laughs> <laughs> that is, and the ant's like, stop it. We've got some beautiful colors here. Ant's eye view under the picnic table. Great work, Jojo. Ooh, Parker, I love the Rubik's Cube. Nice three-dimensional three touch there, too. Oh, and a Minecraft creation with giant rabbit. Now oh, it's time for math dad. Great work, <laughs> great work, Rishab. We love it. Jameson. Oh, and I like that. He's got, you know, just how big the couch looks to an ant. That's perspective of a Pokemon card. <laughs> Very nice. Wow, you coded that. I love it. Well fun. Well done. And a lucky cat. Great job, Carissa. Nice work, Zach. And we'll do one more. This is what you see, and this is what an ant sees. Oh, I love the side-by-side mm, yeah, -side yeah. comparison. 
Very, very clever. That is great. Excellent side-by-side -side comparison. So, uh, as usual, some very nice art. Yes. Very, very creative. Fantastic artwork. Now, our lesson today is on photosynthesis, and I am so excited for this lesson because I love plants. My master degree is in plant science, and when I first went to college, um, I really thought about trying to become a botanist, um, about just pursuing plant science, but then I liked soil science as well, so I got my undergraduate degree in crop science, but I have always loved botany and plants. And when I told Math Dad, like, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to fit it into, you know, 20 minutes, he said, what are you talking about? How, you know, plants are green. <laughs> End of story. What are you going to say about plants for a half hour? And so get ready because by the end of this lesson, Math Dad is going to have new appreciation for plants and hopefully you will too because plants are like, like miracle factories keeping the whole planet running. They're incredible. So to start off with. I'm just, I'm just thrilled. Let's, let's, let's see this. <laughs> Where does a tree come from? I want you to imagine that you are outside and there is a huge tree next to you. And then my question for you in the chat, and I want you to type a little answer real quick if you have access to the chat and it's handy. Where did that tree come from? So it started out as a small seed, right? But it got huge. And where did all that mass come from? So I'm not asking about the seed. Of course, the tree starts out as a seed. But how did the seed get to be so enormous? Where did all of that mass come from? And I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing several people saying, saying seeds. I'm seeing some people saying carbon. It does, carbon makes up a lot of the mass of the seed, but where did it come from? Did it come from the soil? Where did it come from? A couple of people said roots. Someone said water and sunlight. Someone said the ground, a few more carbons and the sun. Here's the amazing thing, because when we look at a tree, and I want you to imagine one of the biggest trees you've ever seen, all of that mass, you're right that it is mostly made up of carbon, but 96% of what makes up a large tree or any plant that you see came from water and air. The minerals that are in the tree that had to come from the soil, that the roots brought up from the soil, those only make up a very small percentage of the actual mass of the tree. Most of the tree is carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen put together into these complex sugars and starches that then can be used to build leaves and bark. And all of that carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen it came from air and water. And that's really amazing if you stop to think about it, that trees can transform a gas and a liquid into this solid stuff, into fixed carbon that then can be used to make so many other things. So that is my, just sort of, to me, that's mind blowing. Every time I think about that, I'm amazed at the power that plants have. And the way that they do it is through photosynthesis. So let's take a look at transpiration. And I'm going to ask Math Dad because I forgot to get this at the beginning. Will you go grab that cabbage from our fridge real fast for me? So I have a little assignment for you guys, a little experiment that you should definitely try because this is a pretty awesome experiment. And it's real simple too. All you need is some type of plant. And a type that you eat and you might have in your fridge is a really good candidate. So it can be cabbage, like what I'm using, a leaf of cabbage, or it can be a stick of celery or a carrot or um, even a couple potatoes. It can be anything, but if you can find something leafy, like a, a leaf of kale or a leaf of cabbage, that's the best. And here's how the experiment works. You're gonna take one of these leaves and you're going to put it in water so that it's standing up in a glass of water. And then you're gonna take another leaf and the second leaf, you're just gonna lay on the counter. And when you lay it on the counter, you're not gonna put any water on it you're just gonna lay it down. So you've got, here's how the experiment works. One leaf just laying down, the other leaf in water, and then come back in about a day and see what has happened to these leaves. And you'll see that this one is gonna totally shrivel up almost to nothing. It'll dry out. This one is gonna look about the same. And the reason it looks the same is because this leaf is doing something called transpiration. And I'm gonna move us around real quick to the whiteboard and just draw a couple cool things about photosynthesis. So transpiration is one of our cool science words for the day. And it really just means the movement of water, that you have little water molecules down here, and they are moving up through the leaf out into the air. 
And that's happening in the leaf and that's what keeps the leaf nice and firm and leaf-like. So if you have water, this in a cup of water, it's gonna stay like a, like a leaf because most of this leaf is actually made up of water. But if you just leave it out and it dries out, it's gonna get pretty crispy and, and dehydrated pretty quickly. So transpiration is how plants breathe. It really is kind of, you can think of it as breathing because as they're letting water out, their little holes in their leaves, these little holes are called stomata, and these little holes right here let something else in, and that something is carbon dioxide. And that's the main gas that plants use to make themselves, to make themselves grow bigger. And it's really awesome because if you think about it, you are bigger today than you were, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. When you were a very small kid, a little toddler running around, you were really small. And the reason that your mass increased and the reason that you got taller and larger and able to do more things is because you were eating food. If you did not have any food, you would not be able to grow bigger. We get our energy from food and we have new molecules to add to our body and are able to grow bigger thanks to food. But plants get their energy from sunlight and they get their new carbon to grow bigger from CO2, which is really just amazing. Now, some another our, our second little extension activity to this cabbage leaf experiment or celery or, you know, a flower or a carrot, anything that you have that you want to use. But a leaf like cabbage or celery will work the best for this part is that you can trick the plant into taking other things up into it when it's transpiring. If you put some little molecules of food coloring here. So here's our and for fun, I'm just going to kind of make like a little blob here that is blue. If we put some blue food coloring into here, some of that food coloring is gonna get taken up to the leaves. And I have a couple cabbage leaves that I put into containers last night. And they started out being whitish yellow, just like this one was. But the one in green food coloring now has quite a bit of green. And you can see it's really dark up here by the leaves where more of those stomata are and more transpiration is happening. And then the other one that's looking the best so far is probably our red one. If you'll hand me the red one. And this red one is starting to turn a nice pink color, but they're gonna need another probably six hours or so before they turn complete colors. But when they do, I'll post a couple pictures online or maybe I'll show them to you again tomorrow and you'll be able to see that we're gonna get some impressive color changing thanks to transpiration. Can we see them all at once actually? I'm, I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm gonna just move the camera down because th then you get to see the comparison. So here are our cabbages. They looked all the exact same color yesterday, but we've got purple, which is kind of behind the game, green, um, orange, red, yellow, and blue. And then we'll take another look tomorrow and see how the, the color is doing tomorrow. Now, I bet you are wondering, this is pretty cool that we have water that goes like up through the top and leaves through leaves, and you can have nutrients from the roots kind of carried to the rest of the plant. And it's cool that plants can take carbon and turn it into stuff, but how do they do it? How do they actually take carbon and turn it into stuff? And I'll give you just a real quick, simple explanation because photosynthesis is really pretty awesome. And it has a cool story to it because it's actually not very efficient. And it all has to do with this big enzyme called Rubisco. Rubisco. It stands for, I think, ribulose bisphosphate something something oxidase. It has a really, really long name. But Rubisco is one of the biggest and most abundant enzymes on the planet. And an enzyme is just like a little, a little protein that's going to do a job. And Rubisco's job is to take carbon, CO2, and to turn it into not CO2. So to basically to turn it into a little tiny sugar. And once it turns it into this little tiny sugar, then the plant can use it to build all sorts of things. But Rubisco gets confused. And a lot of the time that Rubisco tries to grab carbon, it grabs oxygen instead. And then the plant's like, mayday, mayday, you made a mistake, that's gonna cause problems. So the plant actually really wants to get rid of oxygen inside its leaves. It does not like oxygen being there. And here is, in a nutshell, here is how photosynthesis works. It's really pretty awesome because you have another molecule called chlorophyll, chlorophyll. And chlorophyll kind of looks like a blob with a big long tail. And chlorophyll, when light hits it, it captures 
that energy and it uses it to split water, which is just amazing. It takes water, it splits it apart so that then you have oxygen and then you have these little protons and it builds up this gradient. The plant builds up this gradient of protons. And then once it has enough, it's like, just like a little hydroelectric dam. It's like, now we have power and we can run all these reactions with Rubisco. And so that in a nutshell is how photosynthesis works. Light energy charges chlorophyll, chlorophyll splits water, and then it powers Rubisco so that Rubisco can take carbon dioxide and turn it into a little sugar. Now, you may have noticed that most plants are green, and that is because of chlorophyll. But there are two types of chlorophyll in plants, and I'm gonna show you a quick picture that um, a friend of mine made. So this is from a, a friend of mine who has a Instagram page called Doodles in the Membrane. And I want to know, I'm gonna pull up the chat real quick. Tell me if you can spot the difference between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. So we're just showing like the round part of the molecule where that R is, there's a big long tail that goes down. But can anyone tell me what the difference is between chlorophyll A and B? Can you tell Math Dad? Math Dad's looking at this and he's like, oh man, they look identical. Ring of carbon, there's a magnesium in the middle. Mm -hmm. Ooh, there's an extra red. Ooh. Yes, and Amy, I'm seeing several people learn and play, and Maisie are all saying the same thing. There is another red molecule in chlorophyll B. There is a little oxygen group over there on chlorophyll B that chlorophyll A does not have. And because of that, we get two different types of chlorophyll that can absorb different types of light. And because they absorb different types of light, they look different to us. Chlorophyll, it turns out, really likes red light and blue light, but green light, it's like, eh. I don't know how to use this. And so the green light is reflected back and that's why chlorophyll looks green to us. But we can see these two types if we do a little chromatography experiment. So our next little experiment that I, that I have to show you, if you can hand me that plate math dad, is you'll want to mash up a bunch of leaves. So here I have some mint leaves, a purple heart leaf that was from a house plant I have, and then some pomegranate leaves and, um, some weeds from outside, some little dandelions that I mashed up. And then I, after I squished them, I took a piece of coffee, pa coffee paper, coffee filter, and I just dabbed the bottom part into the leaf. And you can see that the chlorophyll is starting to separate. I put it in a jar that had some fingernail polish remover. And as the fingernail polish remover moves up, we're getting kind of two lines here of green. And one line is a little bit fainter. One line is a little bit darker. One of those is chlorophyll A. One of those is chlorophyll B. And then down here where it's purple, we've got some other pigments. And with our mint leaf, you can see that little brown spot. Those are other pigments too. If you see leaves that have purple in them, that's kind of like sunblock for the plant. Because certain plants, if they're out in bright sun, they're like, oh boy, we want the sunlight, we want the energy, but it's too much. And if they make that purple pigment, then that helps the, the chlorophyll not to get overwhelmed with too much light. Just that, you went over that really fast. So Okay, sorry, you, I'm so you, excited, you, you, I couldn't you, help myself. You just dangled these down in this, what, what's the solution at the bottom? Fingernail polish remover. So yes, if you want to separate out those two types of chlorophyll, then you can get a piece of paper, and it can be any type of paper. It can be um, regular paper, it can be a coffee filter, it can even be toilet paper, but with um, the coffee filter and the regular paper, it's easier to smush the leaf onto it and make a green stripe. With tissue paper, toilet paper, you've got to be more careful because it'll tear. And then once you get your little stripe of smushed well, up just, leaf... Sorry, I, I see that the liquid is climbing up slowly as, as it gets absorbed. Yes. Yeah, once you get your stripe of small leaf, then you put it in this jar, tape it to the top, put it in the jar with some rubbing alcohol, and then the rubbing... Not rubbing alcohol. I can't believe I said that fingernail polish remover. And the fingernail polish remover is gonna climb up the paper. And as it climbs, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are gonna climb at slightly different rates and they will separate out just a little bit up at the top. So those green stripes are what That's is left chlorophyll. over at the end. So you've already done this once. This is ongoing. It'll, it'll keep going a little bit longer, but yeah, I started this one um, about 20 minutes before our show. So this is, um, yeah, chlorophyll chromatography, you can actually separate out the different types of pigments in plants. And if you find a leaf that it has some purple or some red, then you'll see another other stripes of pigments besides just the green. But almost all plants will have green in them because the chlorophyll is how plants do photosynthesis. But 
Sometimes you see plants that are not green. I have a little mystery to share with you guys. If you are, live near Southern Nevada, right now you might see some of this on the side of the road. So if you're driving along and you see this big bundle of orange stuff, your first thought might be like, oh, that's too bad, somebody littered. Somebody just dumped this big thing of string all over the road. But if you look closer, and especially as you start to see more of it, here's our car parked by the side of the road and my daughter helping me gather a sample and you can see this is everywhere. What is it? And if you look really close, you'll see that this orange string is wrapped around other plants really tightly. It spirals all around and sometimes it even is going up in the air like it's looking for something. All these tendrils of orange are actually a plant. And the plant is called dodder, D-O-D-D-E-R, and it is a parasite. Most plants do photosynthesis, but there are just a few plants who have developed this sneaky way of getting around photosynthesis. Dodder is a flowering plant, and here are some strands that we picked the other day. And you can see that it looks, it looks sort of like orange floss, but it is, it is kind of soft, and you can pull it, and you can break it. And these strands of daughter are actually a parasitic plant that will wrap around other plants. And then it makes these little things called hostoria, which are kind of like a little syringe that pulls in, plugs into the plant. And then they pull sugars and water and nutrients from the other plant. When a daughter seed germinates, the little seed is able to get energy from its food reserves for just a couple days. And in those couple days, as soon as it germinates, it starts trying to move toward another plant. And if it can attach to another plant within four or five days, then it starts growing on that plant and you get you get a big growth of daughter. Did you just put some of those in our backyard? <laughs> <laughs> so my 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 daughter, my 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 child, when we were looking at the daughter, which is different than daughter, um, she said, What if you could propagate it? Like what if you could make new daughter plants just by taking strands of daughter? So we we put several around the grass in our backyard. But spoiler alert, daughter does not attach to grass very well. So I don't think it's gonna be a suitable host. And you also, I think, I don't think that you can actually split it apart and have it attached to new plants. But that's the experiment that we're conducting right now. So yes, there is um, some orange stuff in the back of our yard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, couple, couple quick questions. Christina asks, can daughter lock onto humans? No, it cannot. So it is, it's very similar to mistletoe. Mistletoe is also a parasitic plant and mistletoe can only attach to certain species of trees. Dodder can attach to more variety of plants, but it can't attach to grass, it can't attach to people. Good question. Oh, David asks, why are leaves different colors in the fall? That is a great question. So when you do, if you do this little um, chlorophyll chromatography, like with, you'll see different colors, like this, this leaf right here. I don't know how well this shows up in the camera, but there's a little bit of purple and pink down here at the bottom, and then there's the green up here. There are other pigments in leaves besides chlorophyll, but in the, in the fall, before winter comes, the plant recognizes, you know what, chlorophyll, this molecule is kind of expensive to make, and it's pretty important, let's save it. And it pulls the chlorophyll out of the leaves to save it, essentially, so that then it can use it again next year, and then you have left over some of the red and the orange and the yellow pigments that aren't as expensive to make and the plant doesn't need them as much. And so it leaves those in the leaves and then the leaves drop. That's why the leaves change color in the fall. So when you say expensive, you mean it takes a lot of energy? It takes, takes more energy. Yeah, it takes more energy to make chlorophyll. So the plant likes to sort of conserve and recycle that molecule, whereas some of the other pigments are smaller and not, you know, they don't have magnesium, magnesium ion in them. And so it, it leaves those in the leaves. Two more questions and then we'll move on to facts, fact or fiction. Vanessa, um, ooh, can't find it. Mary asks, what did I put in the jar? Rubbing alcohol. No. I can't believe I said that again. Oh, you guys, it's Thursday and I am, I am tired. <laughs> I put fingernail polish remover, hand me that bottle. Here we go. Fingernail polish remover is what I put into the jar. So if you, and I will update the description of the video with just a little outline of how to do this, this science craft. So fingernail polish remover in the jar, and then just a piece of paper with a smushed leaf on the bottom and it will separate the pigments. And then someone else asked, can daughter attach to cactus? 
yes, certain types of cactus it can attach to, but it seems to prefer the, the bushy plants instead. All right. Why do some plants need sunlight and some need, uh, well, some need a little and some need a lot? Is Why do some plants need more sunlight than others? It just depends on what they have adapted to, to, to do. So certain plants will adapt to be in full sunlight and they have a lot of chlorophyll and they might have other molecules that protect them from heat and they're really good at handling bright sun. Other plants have just adapted, they've evolved to grow in shady conditions and that's where they do well. I saw one question pop up in the chat. Could you eat the stuff with the food coloring in it? Like, is that safe to eat? Yes, yes it is. The, you can make a very beautiful, very colorful sauerkraut after you do your cabbage experiment or you know, however you like to eat cabbage. And it's perfectly safe to eat because food coloring is safe to eat. Cool. And the, oh, the question about the type of paper. So you said any paper would work? But the, that any coffee paper, filter paper? The you coffee can? filters work really well. I like those. But I did try it on regular printer paper and on um, tissue paper, toilet paper. And I got some separation on both of those. I think the coffee filter probably works the best, but that's another thing you can experiment with. You can try several different types of paper and then see, see what works the best. Oh man, people have really good question, comments here. Like evergreen Ooh. trees stay green. What about that, huh? Yeah, so see, plants are amazing. And 20 minutes, I'm like, oh, is that enough to talk about plants? No, it's not. But I will just share a few, a few awesome things. We could talk about plants a lot longer, and we will revisit botany and plants again in the future. But I hope that you enjoyed this quick little overview snapshot of photosynthesis, and I hope you also are able to do some experimenting with transpiration. One final thought about plants. When a plant wilts, so if you have like a house plant or a plant outside and it gets really hot or the soil gets really dry and you see the plant start to wilt, what the plant is actually trying to do is to save its life by holding its breath. Because when a plant closes these little pores, these little stomata, then it can't get CO2 in. So it's like it can't eat, it can't breathe. But if it's losing too much water, it will. It will close all the pores to try and keep it from losing water and you know, getting to that permanent wilting point. So that's kind of a cool thing to think about because when you get hungry, do you hold your breath? Would that help you at all? No. No, but when plants, when plants are running out of water, they do, they hold their breath. Hold my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, math dad thought it would be fun because I love plants. He was like, well, if you come up with all the, you know, factor fiction plant facts, I'm gonna miss them all. But if I come up with them, let's see how you do. So he came up with our factor fiction today. All right. <clears throat> factor of fiction. Dendrochronology is the science of calculating a tree's age by its rings. True. And you, you can, you yeah. can count up the rings to see how old the tree is, which is pretty cool. Oh, you weren't supposed to know what it was called. Dendrochronology. I think dendrites were like little like tentacle -like things. Am I, am, I, am I making things up? Um, dendritic like does have that root of like fingers. Yeah. Yeah. So why, uh, it, why do they call it dendrochronology? Counting rings. I don't know. Den yeah. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know my Latin and Greek roots very well, but okay. <clears throat> All right. You got lucky on that one, science mom. All right. Fact or fiction? Don't answer so quickly this time. Okay. okay. Peaches. <laughs> Pears, apricots, quinces, strawberries, and apples are members of the rose family. Ooh, that's quite a few. Peaches, pears, strawberries, roses, and apples. A apricots, quinces. And quinces. They're, they're memories of members of the rose All family. All members of the rose family. I know the answer to this one, but I want to see what people in the chat think. Molly says true. Amy says false. Carrie, James says true. Suzanne says true. And you are all correct. It is true. The rose family is enormous and it has all of the prunus genus and that's like all of our fruit trees like apples, quinces, pears, apricots, and then it also has strawberries and other other members. So the rose family is really big. I think there are more than 4,000 species in the rose family. Yeah, that, that's pretty crazy. That for Roses, what did those have to do with like fruit trees? Apparently a lot. I... They do. Well, if you look at the flower on a apricot tree, it it you know it does kind of look like a simple rose flower. Not, not not like not really, the roses. Does it? <laughs> so yeah, like climbing roses that have kind of simpler. They don't they don't have so many petals. They they look kind of similar to fruit tree flowers. Hmm. So maybe what I think of as a rose is not the most representative of that that family. But uh, all right, all right, you got that one. All right. <clears throat> Fact or fiction: Eating lots of onions will make you sleepy, as it acts as a sedative. Eating lots of onions makes you sleepy. Um. 
I don't know this one. Help me out in the chat, you guys. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a plant one. Yeah, okay. I'm seeing a couple trues and a couple falses. I'm going to go with false because... I've never gotten sleepy eating onions. It's entirely possible that they do have a compound that could act as a as kind of a depressant, or, but I don't, I don't know. All right. And the answer is uh, true. So, so th th there is some some compound. That, what compound is this? Uh, I, I wrote it down in the actual answers, but uh, off the top of my head, I don't recall what it is. So if you've downloaded the worksheet, you, you can read what that is. So I... Uh, so technically true, but it, it, it's not like it would be a good cure for insomnia because it's going to give you gas, and bl bloating, and you'd have. To, I imagine yeah, you'd have to eat a whole lot of onions for this effect to happen. Like eat one onion, nothing happens, but eat like ten onions at once. Well, mild sedative effect. I don't plus know that people just start eating effects. big onions all at once. I, I no. assume one onion would be enough, but um, but yeah, it, it does have some some compound in it that will make you sleepy. All right. All right, and finally, fact or fiction, carrots were originally purple in color. So I know that carrots can be purple, and I know that the heirloom varieties of carrots have purple, white, orange, and, you know, kind of this reddish, like lots of different colors. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if the first carrots were purple. Um, wild carrots tend to be more white-ish. Um, yeah. I'm seeing some teas in the chat. I'm going to say true. I'm going to trust these guys. It is true. It, yes. it is true. So if you went back to the 16th century, almost all carrots were purple. And I mean, there are wild carrots that, that are kind of more whitish, but um, I think it was Dutch horticulturists actually started messing around with them, crossbreeding, and they were able to come up with these orange carrots that actually taste a bit better. Ooh. And that for pretty soon they, they started spreading and those became the, the default. Interesting. Hmm? Interesting. Quick question that I saw in the chat about daughter before we go on to our next um, next segment. Someone asked, is daughter poisonous? And it all depends on what the host plant is. Because daughter is going to pull nutrients from the host plant. And if the host plant is poisonous, daughter will be pulling those poisonous chemicals into it as well. It, it takes a lot of sugars and other things from the host plant. So it, it'll all depend on what the daughter's attached to. I would not recommend eating it. It looks kind of weird, yeah. It, it is kind of a weird plant, but really crazy cool plant. Now, we have something special today. Mm -hmm. dun, what, dun, what is dun, it? Dun, dun, dun. Happy birthday, Ethan! Yeah. One of our patrons today has a birthday, and um, him. I bet they would like it if you would sing a song, man's dad. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. Not that I song. don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. <laughs> that, that, that was the song you wanted? No? No, so Happy Birthright, like the traditional version we sing is copyrighted, so I knew you weren't gonna do that one, but I was thinking like you'd make up your own Happy Birthday. Um, yeah, that, that was almost what I did, yeah. So. <laughs> I do have a happier birthday having heard this having song. Having heard the song. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, happy birthday, Ethan. <laughs> I guess so. All right. It uh, is time for our math lesson. All right. So we are going to talk about fractions yet again today. And uh, there are more exciting math topics than fractions. So, but the fractions are super useful. They, they are. They're, they're super useful. And I'm, I'm going to throw up a Desmos code here. And... I want you guys to, to write this one down and maybe save it for later because I'm, I'm actually not going to get into this particular activity. It's something of a fraction playground um, where, where you can, yeah, to just explore fractions and, and just think about them visually. So we, we've is, talked about- Is your fraction ninja one in there? Um, not this time. Not that time, is. No, I, 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 and as a matter of fact, I didn't make this activity. One of our patrons made it. So thank you, Kendra, for creating this activity and uh yeah this this one is yeah think, think of it just a fraction fraction playground It'll, it'll test how well you understand fractions it's designed for more of a classroom setting but yes yeah, the type of thing that if you've got questions call your parents in and if they're struggling with it you make them think it through and f figure it out so all right so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about fraction operations so it turns out the easiest fraction operation is, is probably going to be multiplication. 
So if I want to do two thirds times one seventh, that's not bad. I just multiply the numerators. Two times one is two, and three times seven is 21. So multiplication of fractions is, is pretty easy. Okay, let's try it. What about division? So I'm gonna change this to a divide sign. How would I do two thirds divided by one seventh? So this is something you'll learn in uh, probably fourth, fifth grade. Not even sure. All right, so two thirds times, we, we change it to a multiplication problem, and I'm gonna just do the reciprocal of the fraction that I was dividing by. We get two thirds times seven over one, and let's see, two times seven is 14, all divided by three. So we're gonna get 14 thirds. This was an improper fraction. We could write it as a mixed number, but I'm happy to leave it there for now. Okay, so division by fractions is actually pretty easy as long as you already know how to multiply your numbers. But then what about addition? To, to add fractions, we've got to understand that because fractions were chopping things into smaller pieces, we need to make sure those pieces are the same size. Otherwise, you can't just start counting them. So, for example, when we make a, a pizza for dinner, my son likes to uh, cut himself a piece that large and then a bunch of smaller pieces for the rest of us. And uh, hmm, if you look at this giant slice here, it's not the same size as the other slices. So we can't just look at this and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven slices and say, ah, oh, that's a pizza with seven slices of equal size. No, no so each of these pieces isn't one seventh of the pizza because they, they weren't equal sizes. It, it, it doesn't really make sense to just count them as far as coming up with an, an understanding of how much pizza is there. So things have to be the same size if you want to uh, add or subtract and, and get a meaningful quantity. So I'm going to just write a fraction here, three-fourths. Three-fourths can be written a bunch of different ways. We are allowed to multiply by the number one. So any, so I can multiply by two over two, So because that's the, the number one. So if I multiply it on top and bottom by two, I would get six over eight. Or if I multiply it on top and bottom by three, I would get nine over 12. Or if I multiply it on top and bottom by four, we would get 12 over 16. There, there are infinitely many ways to write every single fraction. So if we want to add two fractions of a different size, here's what we have to do. So I'm gonna pick something like two fifths plus uh, one fourth. So I want to add those fractions, but We've got different size slices, so we have to subdivide those slices and make it smaller. All right, so this first fraction, this 2 fifths, I'm going to multiply by some number. So I'm gonna multiply by one, but what number do I need to multiply? Well, five and four both go into 20. 20 is the smallest common multiple of five and four. So I'm gonna multiply by four over four, plus, and then we have the one fourth, I'm gonna multiply it by five over five. And I know I'm going fast, uh, just trying to make, make sure I say the rules right, and you guys can, can experiment with this at, at a later time. All right, but I'm, I'm always allowed to multiply by one. You are too. I've given you permission. All right, so that it's eight over 20 when we multiply the first expression, plus, ooh, five over 20. And notice I'm using order of operations here. I did my multiplication problems first and then my addition, it comes next. Do you always do multiplication before addition if you have both of them? Yep, always, unless there were parentheses around it telling you not to. So multiplication comes first in the order of operations. All right, and then finally, now that we have the same size slices here, <coughs> we've sliced things into 20 equal pieces, Eight plus five is 13. So adding and it's subtracting fractions will, will be the, the same process. So we, we need to be able to get a common denominator, which is 
typically going to be just the smallest multiple of both denominators that you have. But if you don't have the same size slices, you cannot combine things. So it's kind of weird that adding fractions can be harder than multiplying fractions. So I've, I've left that Desmos code there. And we're going to turn off the banner in just a moment. But I'm hoping you guys will go home and play around with, with that activity and yeah, see what you can learn and see if you can teach your parents a thing or two. Awesome. Thanks, Math Dad. Cool. Now, as we turn our view around to do our engineering challenge today, I do have an exciting announcement about what tomorrow's not tomorrow, sorry, what next week's topic is going to be. We let our patrons vote on if we should do a full week of, of genetics or if we should do geology and ecology. And if you really wanted geology and ecology, fear not because it will come the week next. But um, genetics got the most votes. So we are going to be covering genetics next week for the whole entire week. And um, I did have a couple people reach out to me saying that they weren't able to access the survey. And I realized that I should have, I used a Google form because that gave me more, more flexibility with the survey. But I, I should have made a note that if you know you didn't have a, a Gmail or a Google address, <coughs> then that would prevent you from accessing the survey. So that's why if you weren't mm -hmm. able to access the survey. And my apologies for that. I didn't realize that. I, I actually have what's in the bag before we get going cool. on this. All right, so you ready, science mom? I'm ready. All right, I'm one color, but not one size. One color, but not one size. Like that could be just about anything. I'm present in the sun, but not in the rain. Present in the sun, but not in the rain? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, I'm confused. I do no harm, and I feel no pain. I do no harm, but I feel no pain. Present in the sun, but not in the rain. <gasps> I follow you. Karen, a shadow. It's a shadow. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank it's, you in the chat. I don't know right. if I would have gotten it without that hint. The chat's pretty handy. It's, we keep you guys around. Right. I like that one color because shadows usually are pretty much the same color, although not always. Remember my light demonstration with the different color shadows? Yeah, I, I didn't write the riddle. <laughs> <laughs> Good that, job. That is true. So our engineering challenge today is to make a some sort of a creature out of an egg carton. So we have an egg carton here. And quick shout out to um, a friend of mine on on Instagram who I got the idea for this activity from. I'll pull it up real fast so you can see it. Hopefully we still have it here. Oh nope, we don't. Just kidding. That's embarrassing. Yeah. Um, but you can you can see it online. So I'm going to cut out some of these, and Math Dad and I are going to give ourselves just like two minutes, because we're kind of shy on time, <clears throat> to make something. All right. So what are you going to make, Math Dad? I'm, I'm scheming. I'm scheming. This is going to be, be tricky. So yeah, a lot of these engineering challenges have to do with raiding the recycle bin. So yep. when you... When you can't go out shopping, you've got to make do with what you have. Some of you will have egg cartons, and some of you won't. But you might have something else fun. Maybe you've got an old shoebox. So what oh. I'm going to make is a caterpillar. And here's my plan for it. I don't think I'm going to have time to complete it during our live stream, but I'll do it later. So if I cut each of these sections, and then if I thread string through them so they're all connected, and then have strings coming up from each one, and then, of course, I can paint it and decorate it. I could sort of create these little um, levers on top where I can make my caterpillar move. That's what I'm going to do. What are you going to do, Math Dad? Um, I don't know. I'm just just trying stuff, you know. While I do, why don't I sing us a song? <laughs> I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. I have it in my head all the time, all the time, because you oh, keep you're singing. welcome. <laughs> someone, someone did ask where that song came from, and it came from a long and boring car road trip that we were on. I forget where we were driving, but we were doing this little game where one of us would pick like a, a bottom melody and then the other one would pick would just improvise along to it. So here you take the bottom. 
So he would start doing that and just repeating it, and then I would come up with something to go along as counterpoint. So we were doing this back and forth, and then I forget how it happened, but the kids like requested something else, and then he started. He sang that little song, and I was like, ah, so annoying, <laughs> dude. I think she loved it. I, I, <laughs> that's the way I remember it. And then the kids started singing it, and it just kind of became a family joke. <laughs> you know, yeah, the road trips, you got to figure out how to keep yourselves entertained or, or awake sometimes if you're the, the driver. Um, indeed. Is, is this why we're out of floss? Because we stole um, all the floss for experiments like this? No, I didn't really want to say this on a live stream, but this is actually used floss. <laughs> <laughs> I had been saving it a little bucket and then I rinsed off because I was like, it might come in useful because we don't have any thread. So I was trying to like be, you know, make it do or do without, use it up, wear it out. All right, I'm washing my hands <laughs> after this. <laughs> yeah, and I'm feeling a little embarrassed because I've got a bunch of people in the chat are like, ew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, waste not, want not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What am I supposed to be making? Critter? Yeah, some type oh. of creature. So, and we, to have time to do the math mystery, we're going to want to finish up real quick, but I'll just save like my work in progress. I've got three little bodies here for my caterpillar, and you can see that they can flex. And so then if I attach strings to the top and I have them attached to a popsicle stick, I'll have a little caterpillar puppet that I can make crawl around on the ground, which I think will be quite fun. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, I like that. And then of course, you know, you can dress it up with paint and color it. I even did find a pipe cleaner so we could give it antenna. Lots of fun stuff. And I'm uh, making a face mask or goggles, because I, I <laughs> Because uh, some critters have funny looking eyes. That would be an impressive pair of kind of creepy eyes. Yeah. So uh, I see you at home. <laughs> All right. Um, last, before we get to our math mystery and our second art showcase, I wanted to just give a quick thank you to everyone who has joined us on Patreon and to everyone who bought t shirts and has donated on PayPal. So we have three science moms um, that we that we pay to help us run the YouTube channel, and we wouldn't be able to do this without them. And thanks to your generosity, we're totally covered for this month. And, but we would love for quarantine bec to become a, a permanent thing. You know, not not every day for the whole entire year, obviously. But we'd like to be here every day with you through the end of the school year, and then over the summer maybe drop down to you know twice a week, or I don't know. We'll we'll do surveys and get your feedback. But I wanted to show you kind of what we need in terms of viewers so we have about a thousand people who watch each time right now and if we can get it up to about three thousand who watch on day one that should get us to the level where we have enough support to to make this an ongoing thing and i made a little calendar not calendar i made a little scale so we were at 375 patrons yesterday and this is sort of our like we cover our cost level where we can pay our employees every month and then up here is math dad and i get paid because currently um we're not getting paid. But we care more about making a difference than making money, and we feel like we really are making a difference, so we're super, super happy to be able to do this for you. One of these days. One of these days. All right, All math right. mystery. Okay, so uh, a lot of people got on and tried out yesterday's activity, and yeah, it was kind of maybe, fun maybe to see. But, the... Yeah, let, let me. Remind you, there were nine red balls, all of the exact same size and shape. However, one of them was secretly a little heavier than the others. And you had at your disposal a scale which could weigh the balls. So whatever a scale looks like. And then, yeah, you would, you could stick balls in here and the scale would weigh it one way or another. And the challenge was to identify which ball is the heavy ball. And I would say that 
of course, you could do this just by measuring every pair. And th then you'd, you'd figure out which ball was the heavy ball once you saw one that it didn't balance when the, the side of the scale went down. But the actual challenge was to identify the heavy ball in only two weighings. What, is there some clever strategy that could be used to identify which ball was the heaviest? And so I created a Desmos activity where you guys could, could try this out. And yeah, several people got in and tried things. And, and a few people got all the way to the end and actually wrote up their solution, their understanding. And there were actually only three different people who wrote up the correct procedure that guarantees you could do it in only two wings. So I wanted to read their names. So King Cat, Jeff, and Nicholas. So kudos to you guys for figuring it out. All right, so what is the actual way of doing this? The, the way that we can guarantee that we will always be able to figure out which ball is the heavy ball in just two wings. So that the secret is I'm going to break up the balls into piles of three. So then I'm going to weigh so three balls on each side. So put these ones here, put these ones here. All right. And then a couple things could happen. If the left side is heavier, we know the heavy ball has to be among these. If this right side is heavier, the heavy ball has to be among those. And if these two weigh the same, Ooh. then it has to be this third pile. So no matter what your result is, you're going to narrow it down to just three balls. That's right. In just one wing, we're able to narrow it down to be just three balls and now that we've narrowed it down to be any of three balls so got my three suspects then i'm just going to do the same thing again i'm going to pick two of them so put one on each side and again one of two things will happen either this one will be the heaviest we will see it right away and then that would be the heavy ball or the other side will be heavier or if these two weigh the same again it's the third and final ball that has to be the heavy ball. So that's just two different wings. You separate them into groups of threes, pick two out of the three groups and weigh them, and you'll be able to narrow it down to just one of three balls after that first wing, and then weigh two out of the three, and the, the leftover one is the one you're after. So this only worked because we knew that one of the balls was slightly heavier. If we'd had less information, if we just said one of the balls weighs a different amount, well, then already we we would have been in trouble. We we couldn't have figured it out in only two wings. Awesome. So, so yeah, kudos to those of you who worked that out, figured out the process. Okay, I have a new math mystery for you. That new math mystery involves a triangle, a triangle dissection problem. So we, we take what's supposed to be an equilateral triangle here. And I'm going to join the midpoints of the opposite sides. When we do that, that gives us an upside down triangle. I'm going to shade the upside down triangle. Okay. Then we're going to do the same thing again. And I'll hold up our worksheet and you can find a nice little diagram there and an explanation of the problem on the little worksheet for today. That's right. So the, and then I'm going to I'm making three branches that are heading towards the corners and I'm just going to keep subdividing and shading in triangles and this is going to go forever and ever and I mean eventually you can't draw small enough to, to draw these in so just assume that this pattern goes forever and ever so some portion of the overall figure got shaded and my question for you our math mystery for today is what fraction of the entire triangle gets shaded Ooh, interesting so i want you guys to to see if you can work that one out very nice thank you math dad you're we're gonna turn around to this direction real quick and um, a couple questions i wanted to answer in the chat are we back tomorrow? We are tomorrow 
um, is Friday. And we have something really cool. Instead of just having Fun Friday where we share some little boredom busters and fun activities you can do, we are going to start with an interview with a psychologist. Dr. Marshall is going to come on and join us tomorrow. She's going to talk a bit about the psychology of isolation and some coping strategies and things that you can do when you're stuck at home to sort of help that stress be a little bit a little bit less. And it should be, it'll be great. We're super excited to have her on. So that will be the first little part of quarantine will be an interview with Dr. Marshall. And then we've got some, just some fun stuff for Fun Friday at the end. Indeed. And um, I'm gonna take just two questions cause we're kind of shy on time. And then we will do um, an art showcase at the end. And if you would like to join us for Painting with a Scientist, which will be on in 15 minutes from now, there is a little printout of a desert scene with a prickly pear cactus. And that's what we'll be doing. So is that on Patreon? Yes. Yep. Right. Same, same link is for the worksheets. And it's a free download that you can grab. And we'll be talking a little bit more about photosynthesis and just how awesome plants are. All right. What questions do we have? So I did see a question about flowers being different colors. Oh, and a question from Madison about if daughter can be different colors. There are many different varieties of daughter, D-O-D-D-E-R, that parasitic plant. Most are kind of an orange in color, but there are some that are sort of a pinkish color, and there are some that have maybe just a little bit of a hint of green because they do a tiny bit of photosynthesis, but they're mostly parasitic. Most varieties of daughter are orange, and the one that grows around here is always orange. Why are flowers different colors? It has to do with the pigments, with little little chemicals and molecules inside the flower is what gives them different colors. One awesome thing about flowers is they look different to bees than they do to us because bees can see UV light, they can see ultraviolet light. So oftentimes what just looks like a plain flower to us will look like two different colors to a bee because of them being able to see UV light. So great question. Oh, and what's the drawing prompt? Thank you for the reminder, mm -hmm. Michelle. Our drawing prompt for today is to draw a plantimal, to draw Ooh. a cross between a plant and an animal, and then tell us where it would live and what it would do. So plants and animals, I mean, we're so different. Plants always stay in one place. Plants do photosynthesis. We move around and we get our energy from food. But if you were able to combine the two, to combine a plant with an animal, what type of a new creature would you get? Mm. So I I'm think wrong. it's I'm excited for real, that. real fun drawing prompt. So that's our drawing prompt for tomorrow. And now we have just three minutes left. We will share our screen and share some more art with you from our art showcase. More ant perspectives. Yes. So perspective from an ant. So we have a, another indoor scene of furniture. Very nice. Enormous chairs. Yes. I like it, Grace. Good colors. And then a slipper. It looks very different from the perspective of an ant. Those, that tread underneath looks enormous, it's like um, tunnels. Alexis. Oh, <laughs> and looking at an apple saying, I'm so hungry. Wow. The song. The song is there again. <laughs> it's a beautiful song. I, I, somebody in the math mystery so, so, like they, they they actually joined twice just so they could write stop singing that song <laughs> <laughs> and then elliot drew an ant's perspective of a water bottle very nice mm. Ooh, and this is a roll of tape with a kind of little clues good job lily <laughs> a phone which looks enormous great job sanjaya sanjana mm. and Ishal. Ishal. oh very nice so much food it looks so big yeah. Oh, and the engineering challenge. Oh, I'm so impressed. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. They balanced a fork, single fork. Single fork on a toothpick. I wonder how long that took. Fantastic. Oh, and now they're just showing off. They did two pairs on <laughs> one glass all at all the same time. Fabulous. Fabulous. Good job, you guys. <laughs> oh, my goodness. These are awesome. Whoa. The plastic ones. That's an interesting. Okay. We, we should... I wish you guys could see Math Dad's face. It's like jaw dropped. Man. He's totally amazed. These are really cool. I think they can see our face. I think they can. <laughs> that setting is on. Yeah, man. Good job, you guys. <laughs> Dang. Whoa. This makes me want to go and, and do some more practice with silver rust sculptures because these are really impressive. Ha! <laughs> A duct tape. All right, duct, duct tape. All right. Duct tape for the win. <laughs> oh, nice. They did a, a replication of the Golden Driller statue in Oklahoma. Awesome. Nice. 
And then last week, we, or not last week, yesterday. oh my goodness, yesterday, which kind of felt like last week, um, <laughs> we did a good, the bad, and the bubbly for our lesson on microbes in Painting with a Scientist. We had some fantastic artwork done, some freehand, some with the printout, and I had a lot of fun sharing that with you guys. So thank you again for joining us. And thank you also for, I've seen some fantastic questions in the chat. I wish we had more time, but I've got to wrap things up so I can get ready for painting with the scientist. I hope that you enjoyed learning more about photosynthesis. And we'll see you tomorrow with an interview with a psychologist, with Dr. Marshall, and with some really fun kind of boredom busting games that will help you um, have some fun with indoor activities. There might be a chance to ask science mom questions if you show up for the art hour. Yes. All right. Take care and be safe.